In the first two lectures, you first learn what controls abiotic carbonate precipitation, and then you are introduced to the concept of carbonate factories. In this lecture, I'm bringing you to a modern carbonate factory. I'm bringing you to the beach. This will be our opportunity to understand the biological controls on carbonate precipitation. Well, welcome to Bar Al Hikman. This place has it all. Beautiful blue seas, sabha, white beaches. It is one of my favorite spots in Oman. I love to camp here. But the reason we're here is because this is a modern carbonate factory. And it's a great opportunity to talk about the biological control on carbonate precipitation. So we left it in the last lecture at the fact that we had three major carbonate factories. Remember the M factory or micrite mud mound, the C factory or cool water carbonate controlled, and the T factory, the topmost water tropical factory. And I said already that the T factory is the most abundant factory in terms of carbonate production. So we're going to focus really on the control of the T factory. I'll speak about the other factories as well in the, in the next lectures. But the T factory is probably the one that you need to know the most. It's the one you'll encounter the most. So let's see what controlled this factory. And let's start a little bit by focusing on the role of the reef, because the T factory is characterized by the presence of well-developed reefs. So here you can see a coastal um, reef and it's very clear that one of the functions that the reef has is to break the waves. You can see how these waves come and crash on the reef. So that means that the energy of the wave is diffused. You have strong energy coming in, the waves crashes on the reef and behind the reef you have a protected area where you have less wave energy. And this is a theme and, and a concept that is very important to understand for, for carbonates. So if we look at the reef architecture, the reef architecture is really based on this idea that you have waves coming where the wind is coming. So this is known as the windward side of an atoll or of a platform where the waves are actually the most strong. So the wave come and crash in the shallow on the reef. That means that you need to have a, a top of the reef within the, the wave base. So we're talking a few meters uh, deep here. That reef need to be rock solid. It needs to be lithified. It needs to be bioconstructor that bind at the position. And the benefit for those bioconstructor, because remember the tea factory are mainly composed of autotroph organisms. These bioconstructor, like modern corals, for instance, need light to grow. And the benefit for them to be in a high energy, the high wave energy area, is that it cleans the sediments away. It moves the sediments away. So they are in shallow and clean water, and so they can best photosynthesize. Now, if you move away from this reef, if you go down on the slope of the reef, so you go deeper into uh, the reef, you will see that the corals can become a little bit more delicate because the wave energy is less intense. So you have more delicate branching uh, forms instead of the encrusting and massive corals at the top. They also need to be branching because there is less light. So they need to try to capture all the light that there is. And then if you go even deeper, you get into platy types of corals. And then if you go too deep, then you stop producing uh, corals. or you, you, It's no longer really ideal for autotrophic production. So that's another important theme that we'll see today is that light penetration and water depth play a big role in controlling where carbonates can be precipitated. Now, at the back of the reef, you have a more protected environment, so you'll typically have more quiescent 
hydrodynamic condition where you can deposit maybe some finer grain sediments. And that's something we'll explore when we'll talk about the sedimentology and the facies uh, belts of reefs. So let's look at the distribution of the reefs in terms of latitude. So here you have a global reef distribution map and the reefs are shown in red. And you can see something striking. All the reefs are within 30 degrees of latitude away from the equator. So 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south, we have reefs. Beyond this, we do not have reefs. So there's a strong control on latitudes on the reefs. This, of course, translates into a temperature control on the reefs. Modern corals are extremely sensitive to water temperature. We talked when we looked at the chemistry, we talked about the fact that temperature impacts precipitation of aragonite and calcite. And so it becomes harder for organisms to precipitate a, a calcium carbonate shell when they're in colder water. It's not impossible, it's absolutely possible. We find shells all the way to the Arctic, but it takes more energy to do that precipitation. And, and clearly corals and autotrophs thrive at low latitudes. So on this graph here, you can see different types of uh, organisms that exist in modern carbonate systems. So one that you're very familiar with is corals, the light blue lines. But we'll also talk about Halimeda, which is a green algae that precipitate a calcium carbonate skeleton. So Halimeda is also very common in tropical seas. You can see that the vertical axis represents relative abundance of these different grains. The horizontal axis represents latitude from zero to 40 degrees. And it's striking how Halimeda and corals that are the backbone of tea factories in the modern world, at least in the Bahamas, starts to decline as you go further away from the equator. Even at 10, 20 degrees north, you already have less halimeda, less corals, and they tend to disappear at 30 degrees, 35 degrees um, north or south. They are replaced in terms of abundance by mollusks, bryozoans, and brachiopods. These guys tend to, do, to be more prevalent in colder water. It's not because they produce more in cold water, though. It's because halimeda and corals produce less in cold water. In other words, keep in mind that the vertical axis is relative abundance. Mollusks, bryozoan, and brachiopod are much less abundant producers than corals and halimeda. So if you stop production of coral and halimeda, of the autotrophs, the relative proportion of the non-autotroph increases. But the implication is that the total volume of sediments away from the equator, of, of carbonate sediments away from the equator, decreases. So we have more carbonate production in tropical seas, less carbonate production as we move away into colder waters of you know, the, the higher latitudes. Notice that red algae and forums, foraminifera, tend to be pretty much equivalent in all of these environments. They tend to not really vary that much.